Okay, welcome everyone to our Sydney World Transformation Movement Centre. It's uh, Sunday the 26th of June in 2022. Um, we have some very special guests here today, Lucas Minchin, who's the second from the end, from our WTM Centre in Nice, France, who's come to spend some uh, months with us learning the trade of how to promote this precious understanding of the human condition. Also, Fabiana Hargraves de Costa at the end there, who, who's um, presently living in Norway with her five-year-old daughter, Maya, uh, but is uh, from Brazil, where, where she started a WTM centre in Rio de Janeiro. We've also got some of the stars from our Melbourne WTM centre, Ari and Desi Akratidis in the middle there, and uh, their son, Alex, and their daughter, Nicoletta. Alex is also going to stay for a little while to learn the trade. Um, one precious person uh, we're missing from our Sydney team uh, today is our patron, Tim McCartney Snape, who's presently on one of his treks in remote Pakis, uh, peaks of Pakistan. Um, but Tim's represented by his partner, Stacey, the back there. And uh, uh, my precious brother, Simon, is also out of town at the moment. And, he, and another key uh, precious founding member, Tim Watson, is watching this meeting online. I also want to mention that Professor Harry Proson, uh, is with us in spirit because the first anniversary of Harry's death at the age of 90 was last Tuesday, and I miss him heaps. Uh, of course, the other very, very, very special people are Annie beside me here, um, and all, all my brothers and sisters here in the Sydney WTM Centre who have been all through so much uh, to, to bring this project to where it is today on the threshold of liftoff. Uh, now, I, I want to use this opportunity to bring as much understanding as I possibly can to the problem of our project uh, that our project suffers most from, which is the initial difficulty people have taking in or hearing discussion of the human condition, what we call the deaf effect. Um, the better everyone can understand the deaf effect, the faster our project will move forward and the faster the world will be saved from the frightening looming threat of terminal psychosis and our species extinction. And, and, and as I've explained in my books, that threat's very real. So, um, so this is about the deaf effect and how it's stalling our project and, and let's bring some, some really deep understanding to that issue of issues. Now, um, so after watching the interview and then this presentation on our homepage, the next talk we advise people to watch is titled, You're Blocked in the Most Wonderful of All Gifts. So the obvious first thing to be asking about this title is what is the most wonderful of all gifts? Well, um, once you understand this information, it actually finally brings relieving understanding to every aspect uh, of human life. As Tony Gowing, who's sitting next to Annie here, um, says, and this is uh, in my book, Freedom. If you look at any of the problems in the world with any degree of honesty, they are each in a depressingly dark state. But with this understanding of the human condition, that darkness is completely turned around into the most glorious, happy, light-filled um, situation imaginable. In the world before this explanation, there were no answers. There was no meaning, no direction, no real understanding. Uh, um, I had, Tony said, I had no real idea what to do in the world. No framework of reference, no idea about the meaning of existence at all. But now I have complete understanding of the world. So, um, so that's an example of just how, how the wonder, this wonderful gift. There, there have been many, many comments like Tony's to the effect of being able to understand the human condition. Uh, but, but just to quote another one, this is from Sam Belfield, a tall bloke sitting up the back somewhere. <laughs> Um, 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 this is a comment on our Facebook group this week about my new addendum two in my book, uh, Death by Dogma. Uh, Sam said, without these insights, I would just be lurching from denial to being utterly confused, angry, depressed and distressed about what is happening in Western civilization with nil awareness of the deeper implications for humanity. This handful of paragraphs is so clarifying, enlightening, and, and relieving. So yeah, the ability to explain the human condition 
just unlocks a most amazing ability to, to look into every aspect of our, our lives at last. Yep. So what the most wonderful all gifts is, is the understanding of the human condition that finally brings relieving insight into every aspect of human life. As to how it's able to do this, what I'm going to, uh, going to explain about the deaf effect will, I think, make it very clear why we couldn't explain anything truthfully and thus effectively. Being able to understand the human condition is what makes all the difference when it comes to understanding ourselves and the world. So, so the question that leaves screaming out to be answered, well, uh, what possibly could be our block to this most wonderful of all gifts, which is the title of that first talk on our homepage after, after watching Harry's, uh, the, my interview with um, Craig Conway, of uh, uh, finally being able to understand everything. Well, as I briefly mentioned, the problem is that most people struggle to take in or hear discussion of the human condition. And this is obviously a very serious block because if your mind can't take in or hear what's being said, you're clearly not going to be able to discover the most wonderful or gifts of the under healing understanding um, of every aspect of human life that the explanation of the human condition makes possible. Um, now, uh, to, to bring some illustration to that, an, an American woman, uh, shortly starting a WTM centre, experienced this uh, deaf effect when she said, I tried for months to get through the reading material, but my thoughts at the time was that it was, ju it was just super tedious and boring. Now, saying it, it, it is super tedious and boring is, is typical deaf, deaf effect response, as I'm going to go, uh, go on and hopefully make very clear. The subject of the human condition has historically been so unbearably confronting and depressing that most people's minds don't want to engage with it. And, and so to cope, their minds defensively and dismissively, in effect, says, um, I'm not interested in, in what you're talking about. It, it's just super tedious and boring, meaningless rubbish as far as I'm concerned. Um, Significantly, when this woman persevered listening to and, and reading about this information and eventually got through the deaf effects, she, she was able to discover this most wonderful of all gifts of being able to understand the world. So much so that she said, I find it laughable now how deaf I was because here I am today obsessing over freedom essays, videos and Facebook group posts. It has brought such peace to my life and I have a burning desire to get it to whoever will listen. So um, um, the deaf effect is incredibly real and, and, and blocking this access to this most wonderful gift of being able to understand herself. Now, Fabiana at the, at the end here on the right who's visit, visiting us, um, I know you struggle with the, with the deaf effect. I remember reading somewhere you saying something to the effect that if it wasn't for wanting to help your daughter, you wouldn't have persevered, persisted long enough to get through the deaf effect. Is that kind of what your experience was when you struggled with the deaf effect? Is that right? Uh, yeah, because uh, once I come across it, I was living, having a lot of uh, personal problems in my life and I desperately wanted something to, to guide me specifically in how to solve my problems. I couldn't get out of, and see the macro level of all this. And especially in being a mother, it's just it's a struggle that you feel that crazy love and you can't provide to them properly. You're just mad and crippled with the world. And once you understand this, it's just magical. Yeah, yeah but when you first tried to get through it, you, you found it really difficult. Yes, because because of this, I wanted I wanted to to solve the the problems that I was feeling at that moment, like specifically. Yeah. And uh, and then I I would put it back. I, I for one year I was uh, I wasn't reading anything, and uh, and suddenly when I connected I couldn't get enough of it. I was listening and reading to you like ten hours a day, and hmm. it was just like cry of relief and happiness and joy. Yeah. So you had to. So went for a year with not being able to get back to it and then finally did get back to it and then could get through the deaf effect and discover how useful it was. Yes. And Ari, uh, uh, up here, uh, I know your brother Sam was telling you for many years about this information and I read somewhere where you said, when I eventually read Jeremy's book, A Species in Denial, uh, not, one, not one word of it made any sense to me. Uh, as you said yesterday, 
that uh, as, as soon as I read that I'm competitive and aggressive and selfish, my brain turned off because I, uh, I didn't consider I was any of those things, um, let alone two million years a corrupted human. Um, but now you have got, through the deaf effect, you, you, you and your whole family can't get enough of this explanation. That, that sort of summary of what your deaf effect ex experience? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm still blown away at, at that deaf effect, Jeremy, um, a number of years later that I'm reading the same words and sentences and paragraphs and pages that are that are as beautiful as, as anything can be and that I read that same thing you know, a decade ago and got zero zilch, not a single word could penetrate my denial, you know, and um, it that blows me away, but um, it was extremely deaf and, um, you know, I, I just such denial. And I said to my wife a few days ago, I think I mentioned to you yesterday that I can, I can see now I read this paragraph and I said, I would have read that and said, fuck, that's not me. You know, that's not, none of those things, you know, I've just, I'm so, I've been so focused on being, you know, a good bloke and a good dad and a good brother and a good everything and completely in denial that there's anything wrong with me or the world. And um, yeah, it's extraordinary, Jeremy, but. Yeah, you yeah, know, this deaf effect's very real, which is what I'm gonna go on and try and explain and make very clear why. Um, so, the, the next question is, uh, what exactly is it about the subject of the human condition that causes this initial deaf effect? Uh, now, the 10th the video at the top of our homepage uh, that people are, are recommended to watch is titled, What Exactly is the Human Condition? So that should be relevant to, to what, what this problem is being able to say. What is the human condition? But I think, uh, just thinking about that, in hindsight, what I said there is a bit too indirect. I started by saying the human condition is the riddle of why we humans are competitive and selfish, not cooperative and loving, and uh, it's the issue of good and evil in our makeup, and even it's the issue of why we are the way we are. But, but I think I should, I should have got straight to the point and said that the human condition is the incredible guilt and shame we humans experienced when we became conscious and started being competitive and selfish and aggressive when our instinctive selfless soul expected us to behave cooperatively, selflessly and lovingly, in other words, in the opposite way. The human condition <coughs> is the guilt we, <coughs> we, we feel for having corrupted our soul. That's what the human condition really is, this shame, this historic shame, okay? which is what my work's all about explaining <coughs> um, why we corrupted our soul. So I now want to explain as clearly as I possibly can this immense guilt and shame that had happened when we became conscious and able to understand cause and effect and as a result started to take over management of our, of our lives <coughs> from our instincts, which as I explained in my introductory video with Craig Conway and in all my books, is that is what caused us to become psychologically upset, competitive, selfish and aggressive. Um, when we became conscious and started to take over management of our lives from our uh, dictatorial instincts. So to start at the beginning uh, of this horrendous saga for us humans, I want everyone to imagine what it was like when we first became conscious some two million years ago how confusing and bewildering the world must have been when we woke up consciously, as it were. Um, I mean, it's hard to try and imagine, but we, we sort of woke up, we became, and we looked around and we started trying to understand everything. You know, I mean, what was the meaning of thunder and lightning? Did it, did it represent some sort of attack on us? Why was the sun taken away at the end of each day and we were then given a pale substitute for it, not the moon, you know, surrounded by little eyes looking at us, the stars? Why aren't animals like uh, kind to each other like we were? Um, why are crocodiles so damn nasty, et cetera, et cetera? So these are sort of questions when we woke up because we don't sort of stop and because we've never been able to explain why we corrupted our souls or we don't want to go near this, but... It, we can start looking at this now, trying to imagine what it was like when we first became conscious some two million years, and years ago and started thinking and watching and trying to make sense of everything around us. Um, the world was certainly a big mystery. 
But now that I want, now what I want to point out about that is that we could cope. And this is really interesting and very important. We could cope with that situation because we had our loving soul to look after us. Bewilderment at this early stage of being conscious wasn't a problem because we had so much room in ourselves, so much kindness and generosity and love for each other and for the world around us. We could cope with mystery and hardship. Um, bewilderment about the meaning of everything wasn't too distressing. Children, if they grow up in a natural, nurtured, loving environment, are full of excitement and wonder, not full of fear and distress. And, and, and I mean, they're little conscious, dawning beings can become unconscious. And when the human race was still innocent, even though conscious thinking was underway, we were like little children throughout the whole of our lives. We, we were doing lots of thinking, but we were happy living together and living with nature around us. That's what life was like during the, the early hundreds of thousands of years of the development of conscious thought. We were full of love and enthusiasm and happiness. Um, again, not being able to admit that we were once innocent because we couldn't defend why we corrupted it, denied us all this, these abilities to think about what it was like to actually become conscious and, and so forth. But now, but we were still in the arms of our soul that looked after us, if you like. This all sensitive and all loving past was just the most wonderful existence. Now, and this is all important, obviously, but this didn't last. Eventually, as the upsetting search for knowledge developed further, that situation completely changed. Imagine the absolute horror when for some reason that we had absolutely no understanding of, we started to become competitive, aggressive and selfish, behaving in a way that was completely at odds with our instinctive self, uh, self or soul that only knew about behaving cooperatively, selflessly and lovingly. Since we humans today <coughs> have learned to live in denial of our corrupting condition, it's difficult for us to connect with the guilt and shame and horror that, that we are actually living with. But the shame and guilt and frustration about why we became seemingly awful beings has been truly astronomical, as I'm now going to try to make very clear. So becoming conscious led to lots of bewilderment about our world the lightning and the sun disappearing and so forth. But none of those bewilderments were anything like as troubling as the issue of our corrupted condition. In fact, that issue was so troubling, the agony of it was beyond anything we could bear. Sure, we could come, come up with the excuse that we were just like, just being like other animals, always fighting and aggressive, uh, the savage instincts excuse we've, uh, I've talked about. But initially that excuse didn't work because our soul the voice of which is our conscience, was letting us know we should be being cooperative and loving. We hadn't blocked out its voice yet, repressed our soul and its awarenesses into our subconscious as we do now. We, we knew something had gone terribly, terribly wrong, <clears throat> that, we weren't, that we were starting to behave appallingly and, and had absolutely no idea why. So that's another thing we've got to now start trying to immerse ourselves in what it was like to start to become upset humans in total violation of our innocent soul. Um, so we're starting to feel dreadful about ourselves, full of shame and guilt, completely at odds with the wonderful, all-sensitive and all-loving world of our instinctive self or soul. In fact, we were immensely lonely beings who had, in effect, been booted out from our paradisical Eden, condemned as horrible monsters on earth. What other conclusion could we come other than to other than that we were dreadful beings? Now, um, this is uh, one of Australian cartoonist Michael Lunig's wonderful cartoons, and uh, it be beautifully captures some captures some of the horror of our situation, where we were in effect thrown out of our soul's innocent garden of Eden world, and and how upset that made us. So, so we've got here. Uh, eating the fruit from the tree of knowledge, which, may, which is a metaphor for becoming conscious. And then you see the guardian angel uh, <laughs> of the Garden of Eden threw us out. And you can see these expressions are actually quite revealing. The woman is quite appalled and, and the bloke says, buggy, you, you know. So he's starting to get defensive and, and she's really distressed. 
And he's starting to think, getting even more angry. So finally he gets the chainsaw out and tears the whole place down, which is sort of what we've done. So then he sets fire to the whole joint and burns it to smithereens, which is kind of what we've done. So this is a little metaphor of, um, um, the, of what happened, you know, how we were thrown out of innocence and, and felt ashamed and got, got defensive and angry. So this is an extra little row I've drawn to add it to the bottom of it because when we find understanding, we, we, we call, the, call, call the guardian angel, angel back and we, we show him this book. It says we were good and not bad. And the angel, guardian angel starts crying in sympathy and takes us back to the Garden of Eden. So we're on the way home again. But you can see here that it's a lovely little anecdotal story of, of our shame and, and how it's affected us, how it upset us. Yes, we have been immensely, immensely lonely, feeling that we were just garbage on earth and that everybody and everything hated us. It's hard now for us to see the situation because we are so, so practiced at denial. But we need to try to imagine just how lonely our situation has actually been. Um, biblical, the biblical prophet Isaiah described our situation truthfully when he said, justice is far from us and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness. For brightness but we walk in deep shadows. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like men without eyes. Truth, in other words, um, understanding of our corrupted condition, is nowhere to be found. Yes, as the prophet of our time and now noble laureate of literature, Bob Dylan, sang, how does it feel to be on your own with no direction home like a complete unknown? So what I'm trying to do is immerse everybody in in a truthful rendition of the human journey of how horrible it was when we started to buy. We had a once an innocent, loving existence and then we corrupted that and we had no idea why on earth that was happening. And the shame was astronomical. So, and the loneliness of our existence because it's like we had violated everything fundamental about our world and. So this is a painting by William Turner called The Fisherman at Sea, and it captures something of the astronomical heroism of the human race struggling for two million years, uh, which is the time we've been conscious, through a terrible, terrible, lonely darkness of guilt-stricken bewilderment and seeming evil badness and the feeling that leaves us, that, that we are no good, utterly meaningless creatures. It's a very powerful picture. It's got this huge storm and darkness and, and this small boat and these people hunker down in, in, in the middle of it trying to look after each other against this overwhelming um, world of, 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 of con condemnation. It's a very, very powerful I image. Um, you can see the people in the boat huddled together. And we had uh, we, we had to be our own friends because we were no longer a friend of our, our soul and the rest of the, the world associated with it. Um, we have been very, very, very alone beings. Now, this is really interesting. I think you'll all enjoy this. This, um, this is a photo of a settlement that was um, uh, created some 12,000 years ago at a place called Gopalteki. In, in Turkey, Anatolia in Turkey. It's the oldest permanent settlement anywhere in the world. So, so that's absolutely amazing to have found, to think about. Um, it possibly or even probably arose following the advent of agriculture, which allowed people to transition from a hunter-gatherer uh, existence to living sedentary life. Now, I want you to look at the, these are teep, these are, now, now, these T pieces, some 10, 10 foot, which is three metres high pillars, populate every enclosure. They clearly represent people. The arms on the side of the pillar, the arms on the side of the pillar go round to hands in the next photograph. You can see the hands coming round the side here. So the arms come down, then the hands. So it's clearly a, a person. And this is the, the their... Um, the, the arms around the side go down to hands on the side and you can see the waistband with an animal skin hanging over the loins here. So it's, they're clearly uh, people, these, these uh, 
T-pieces, T-shaped pedestals. Uh, anthropologists aren't sure how to interpret, interpret them, but I think it's clear they represent ancestors and, and that what these Neolithic people were doing was surrounding themselves with the comforting presence, presence of their ancestors in order to counter the utter loneliness of being condemned as evil beings. And this agony of our corrupted, lonely condition could have rapidly, would have rapidly developed with the advent of agriculture and sedentary living because moving from a hunter-gatherer existence where we were surrounded by innocent nature all day long, people were now living on top of each other, with great link, which greatly compounded the increase and upset in everyone. I've written about it in my books, and I quote the historian Man Manning Clark pointing out that the bush, i.e. wilderness, is our source of innocence. The town is where the devil prowls around. Now, this next photograph, to me, this photograph of the Bushmen of the Kalahari sitting together is very like the picture uh, of these ancestors, ancestor pillars in this big circle at uh, Gobbleteki. The Bushmen are sort of sitting, uh, sitting with their backs to nature because nature was, was hating us, so, so we huddled together and just looked after each other. As I explained with this photo in the, uh, of the Bushmen in my book, Freedom, nature was so condemning of us, we got even with it by hunting down and killing innocent animals. Hunting was all about killing animals for their innocence, implied criticism of us, not about getting food, which is what we've been taught, which is what women's gathering supplied. In fact, the photo was titled Telling the Hunt, telling how, quote, I smashed some innocent animal to death. Ha, ha, take that. And... So, um, um, so, so this picture is so like with them all looking inwards. It's so like that the picture of those tea pieces. If we go back, neck go down to there. You see, they're all in a circle, and there's another circle over there. They're all looking inwards. Uh, all these these ancestors are looking in, in the middle of it, forming a circle, and they're thin, so they don't take up too much room, and. Um, uh, so I'm saying that surrounding ourselves with our ancestors was a result of, as a result of the incredible loneliness of our lives when we couldn't understand why we had become seemingly evil monsters. Like the fishermen heroically huddled together in their boats, riding out the terrible storms around them and in them. Anthropologists don't recognise that our species was originally innocent, so, that, so they're not able to make sense of anything. They can't begin to connect with the psychological predicament of our lives. So, so they're failure trapped, as Emma's phrase she, she, taught, she told me about, which is a really good description. Failure trapped, not, not going to make any real sense of anything. Our species' original state of innocence is such a fundamental truth that to try to make sense of it, our world, while denying it, was like trying to understand how a car works while being determined to not look under the bonnet. Uh, as Professor Harry Prosen said about my interview with Craig Conway, it is the most important interview of all time because it turns all the conventional knowledge about human existence on its head with its recognition of the original cooperative and loving innocence of our species. So, yeah, every, everything starts to make sense when, once we can admit our species' original state of innocence, which we now can because we've found the good reason why we corrupted our soul. But nothing really makes sense when, when you can't admit that truth. It, it's just one big world of lies and bullshit, which is the astronomical dishonest world we have been living in. Astronomically dishonest. As everyone in this room has discovered, solving the human condition, explaining why we are good and not bad, opens up a whole new world of truth, which all begins by admitting our species once lived in an innocent, loving state. Um, no one has ever talked the way I, I am today and in my books freely about our species' original innocence and all the insight that gives insights that gives us into the human journey. This is the first true description of us, which is why this should all be astonishingly interesting, what I'm talking about. Um, now, since this is one of the, those interesting insights, uh, I might also include this, the occurrence of so-called goddess or Venus figurines uh, that have been found in these Neolithic uh, ruins in Turkey, like th this one uh, that was found at uh, Chattelhoik. Uh, as I've 
explained in chapter five of freedom. Nurturing is what created our moral soul, which means nurturing was a priority throughout our species' early development. And it was only after we became conscious and the human condition emerged that the priority shifted from being matriarchal to being patriarchal. But matriarchal didn't give, matriarchy didn't give in to, to patriarchy for a long time. As I explained in paragraph 810 of Freedom, the extremely regal stature of the very real, very well-nourished figure seated on her throne of cheetahs shows just how powerful and in control of their society women were right up to, the re to recent times because these early settlements in Turkey around 10,000 years ago were clearly still matriarchal, still uh, led by women. This, situa this situation where women were seemingly in power in the Paleolithic and Neolithic was a case of delayed ownership, it's a situation where the new pa owner, patriarchy, wasn't able to take over because the old owner, matriarchy, refused to relinquish power. As I explained in Freedom, women are soul sympathetic, not ego sympathetic. So sooner or later, ego sympathy, support for our species upsetting battle to find no knowledge, ultimately for understanding of ourselves, which was men's responsibility, had to take over. Uh, chapter 811B of Freedom uh, explains the relationship between men and women. It's very important for everyone to read and understand. Um, so I think it's very interesting that matriarchy, patri patriarchy hadn't um, taken over back then, which is not that long ago. And, and I'll make a comment here. And by the way, I think you can observe in this well-nourished figure that we hadn't learned that uh, there was any problem with overeating back then. It took a while uh, to learn that what's wrong with the idea that if food is enjoyable then, and, and there's plenty of it, then why, why not enjoy it? The world of upset, distressed humours was a whole new existence. Um, now this is, this is something that's also very interesting about um, these tea pieces these ancestors. I might also mention that the anthropologists don't know why the people at Gobbleteki avoided putting faces on, on the headpieces of their pillars. But I think with, under, with our ability to admit the truth of our lost state of innocence, we can work out why. To put a face on, the, on our beloved ancestors would have required depicting something of their tortured human condition afflicted uh, lives on their faces when we just wanted their comforting presence, not their agony. I wrote about this in Freedom in paragraph 834, how our soul couldn't and, and didn't want to draw our alienated faces. Um, this is a painting uh, by Francis Bacon uh, from paragraph 124 in Freedom. It gives a, a true representation of how alienated we humans actually are. So it makes sense that, that the Neolithic people didn't want to start reminding themselves of this of how tortured in, uh, in, we really are. Um, interesting to me is how incredibly empathetic my soul is when I let it draw, especially draw happy, soulful things like I did for these people em embracing each other, which was such an instant scribble when I did it. It shocked me how completely empathetic it was. Um, is, is, I, I think Suze uh, was there when, when I sat down and did that quick scribble. I was. It was yeah. incredible. It took about two seconds. Yeah, I was. And then I stand back and, and because I can't draw for nuts normally, but if I just tune right into my soul, it tell, it, it's, it, it's, it's magic what it can produce. Look at this next drawing. Uh, the empathy in this drawing I did of a mother and infant. I mean, how good's that? That is so tender. And you can see, like, I didn't, with the arms, I just threw, just threw them in. I didn't even try very hard. But the expression on the, t anyway. And, and, and this, is, this is another picture. This is a drawing I did of Christ. Um, and, and I think that's, that's a remarkable empathetic drawing too because uh, I know what he was like, which is he was an innocent person. The Lamb of God, as it says in the Bible. And, and that's what I tried to, to capture. Um, I, I do know I, I can draw up, my soul can draw upset humans as well, like I did for, uh, for this drawing of, of the oppressive effects of egocentric fathers on their children. Um, 
But I think it's clear my soul likes drawing soulful humans, not upset humans. And I think that's what's going on with these tea, tea pillars. Neolithic people didn't want to, the upset in their ancestors showing, so they just left the pillars without faces on them. But I think the big blocks for the heads do beautifully signify that these ancestors are a very big comforting present in their lives. The pillars are very stylistically effective, I think. They just didn't want to include reference to this, their ancestors' psychosis, so they left their faces blank. Uh, but the thinking among some anthropologists is that even though they didn't explain, uh, they couldn't explain the, the absence of faces. Uh, they, the figures were able to be identified. They reckon the, the figures were able to be identified by the carving of the person's totem. In this case, by the fox on the pillar. See, if you go to New Guinea or the, most societies, the Aboriginal, in Northern Australia, they're given totems, and they're not allowed to. Um, eat those totems or, 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 um, or hunt them. I should mention there have been a few carvings of faces found in these ancient settlements, but anthropologists think they're depictions of masks. And many ancient cultures do use masks and exorcism rituals for valving off upset. So, um, so, that, so anyway, so that all illustrates how lonely we humans have felt, feeling condemned and ostracised by the whole world. Now, to get back on track with what we're talking about, when we became conscious, we were certainly bewildered by the world, lightning and thunder, who, who stole the sun at the end of the day and so forth. Why are animals so mean? But the biggest bewilderment by a million miles was what occurred when we became conscious. Why? When, we were, when we'd been all been so cooperative, loving and selfless, have we suddenly become competitive, aggressive and selfish, worse at times ferociously mean and vicious towards each other, even sadistic. For some completely unknown reason, we had become brutal monsters from hell who had turned all that was good and, and wholesome into a dystopia of horror. We'd become the most vile, despicable creatures on earth, so awful we felt we shouldn't exist. I mean, animals are pretty ruthless and stuff, but they're not sadistic or, or mean or... Anyway, so which, which all means that thinking about how co we corrupted such a magic life was utterly and completely depressing. A life of utter happiness had turned into a life of life haunted by depression. Sure, uh, uh, we make huge efforts to put on brave faces and, and try to think positively and, and to look positive. But the truth is that depression has been the real and dominant characteristic of human life since the latter part of our two million year long search for knowledge. You see, every second of every day is Tony G's always telling us, you know, people are trying to maintain their, a positive outlook. They're trying to stay positive all the time, all, every moment. And the way they posture about it, well, everything's designed to hold at bay this, un, this deep psychological insecurity that I'm finally trying to explain. Um, um, yeah, so, but underneath that defensive, uh, pretentious, I'm fine, everything's good, as Ari told us about, um, his out, outlook um, was, um, is, is this, it, 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 it's all to counter What's really going on, which is this deep insecurity that we can now understand is the horror of having become corrupted again when we were originally innocent. Um, so I've forgotten where I'm up to. Do you remember where I'm up to? It was, good, it was a good day, wasn't it? We're, we're going along well. Anyway. Um, why, when we'd been so cooperative and loving and selfless, have we become competitive against ourselves? It's worse at times, ferocious, mean. For some completely unknown reason, this dystopia of horror, we become the most vile, despicable, which all means that thinking about it was corrupting, was haunted by depression. Sure, we could make huge efforts, but for too many years, characteristic of our lives has actually been depression. So, might be good to see some honest descriptions of how insecure we are, how fearful we are of the issue of the human condition. So here's some descriptions. This is, this is a, a description of the unbearable depression that the philosopher 
Rene Descartes, I oh, can't speak French. <laughs> Descartes, <laughs> how's that? <laughs> Lucas, what, mate, how do you pronounce it? Descartes. Who? Descartes. Rene Descartes. You're kidding, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a go. <laughs> Rene, how do you do Rene? Rene. Who? Rene. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get on in France? You keep, you can understand each other? <laughs> Rene <Really>, Descartes. <laughs> uh, felt when he tried to confront the horror of our corrupted condition. So serious are the doubts into which I have been thrown that I can neither put them out of my mind nor see any way of resolving them. It feels as if I have fallen unexpectedly into a deep whirlpool which, which tumbles me around so that I can neither stand on the bottom or swim to the top. So he's in this massive depression. And this is another person's description of what he experienced when he tried to confront the human condition. I felt the worst fear I have ever known. Fear doesn't even come close to expressing it. What do you suppose you do when you find the most fearful thing you've ever encountered is yourself? Yeah, as Carl Jung said, when it, our shadow appears, it's quite within the bounds of possibility for a man to recognise the relative evil of his nature. But it is a, sh a rare and shattering experience for him to gaze into the face of absolute evil. So we're starting to get a feel for how insecure this, how well distressed underneath we are by our, in, our, our corrupted condition and how we try to live, have been trying to live in denial at all this time. The artist Francis Goya, Francisco, I don't know how to speak Spanish, Francisco, that is pronounced <laughs> uh, Famous etching, he titled The Sleep of Reason Brings Forth Monos Monsters, depicts how depressing reasoning or thinking about our corrupted condition has been. We see, the ba uh, we see bats from hell tormenting the person's mind. I mean, that's a very famous etching, but no one's ever really explained it. It says, oh, is that a reason brings forth monsters? And now we can really understand what he was drawing. It's a really powerful image of depression. And since pretty well any thinking brought us into contact with the issue of our horribly corrupt and seemingly utterly evil condition, virtually uh, any thinking was unbearable. Oh, that's a lovely sunset. Ugh, I, don't, I, I wonder why I'm not lovable. Pass me the salt. Have I told you about me? Uh, yes, okay. I'm, I'm focused on me, I admit it. Uh, I'm a fucking ego maniac. Uh, get off my case. I mean, whatever thinking, if you really sit down and look at it, it, it'll lead to confrontation with our corrupted condition and then you've got to bolt from there. Um, this is a, now this is a good one. You want to see this one. It, Francis Bacon did this painting and it's, this is very funny. Uh, he painted it from a photo he had of some, some of, of the natural world, which he said he kept. He then kept cutting up with his scissors and, until he was just left with a small piece of the photo. <laughs> and this small piece of grass that he was left with is what he painted. I can't find the quote at the moment, but he said something to the effect that this was all he could cope with in the photo of the natural landscape. By his own admission, Bacon was a very hurt soul, so it makes sense that the innocent natural world was very confronting for him. So he had this photograph. And he says he just kept cutting it, bits off it, bits off it, till he parted it right back to him and said, well, that's about all I can cope with. And then he painted that. He put it in a big box and sort of, it's just a little bit of grass. That's all that's left of the photograph and all the rest is thrown away. Um, and I said, I know people like hiding in alienated cities because they find the natural world too confronting. The more people, the more buildings, the more noise in our headphones, the more busy we can keep ourselves, the better. So that's further way we're constantly trying to keep at bay this confrontation with our corrupted condition. Yeah, so the comedian Rod Contact wasn't joking, even though he's a comedian, when he said, thinking can get you into terrible downward spirals of doubt, nor was the Nobel laureate Albert Camus. Is that right, Camus? Camus, yeah, yeah. Oh, so there's hope for me yet, you know, Lucas. When he said, beginning to think is beginning to be undermined. Nor was another Nobel laureate, winner of literature, Bertrand Russell, when he said, many people would sooner die than think. Nor was another Nobel laureate, 
the poet T.S. Eliot when he wrote that humankind cannot bear very much reality. So, yeah, the sleep of reason, uh, uh, reasoning at a, at a deep level, certainly has brought forth monsters, as um, that uh, picture by uh, Francis uh, Goya. Uh, I emphasise that the reason I've said has brought forth, forth monsters is because, as I emphasised at the beginning of this talk, we have the redeeming understanding of our corrupted condition now that finally allows us to think about and make sense of anything and everything which is absolutely the most wonderful of all gifts. As all our guests uh, at the Sydney WG Centre here today uh, have been shouting to the world from the rooftops as the, um, the, um, that they can climb onto, this is a, a pre-human condition understood situation before that, was, that I'm describing. It's a has-been situation, not an is situation. We're, we're through that, not being able to understand ourselves. So I'm not trying to scare everyone with the horrors of our condition by going through all this. Um, I'm explaining why there is an initial deaf effect when trying to read and hear about the human condition because it's only by understanding clearly why the deaf effect happens that everyone will be able to not be tricked and, and frustrated by it and, and from there be, be better able to persevere until they get through the deaf effect and receive the most wonderful of all gifts of being able to understand everything at last. And, and be forever free of the horror of the agony of the human condition. So yes, we can understand why up until now it, it, we've had to ha have the attitude described in U2's song, Staring at the Sun. It's been a long, hot summer. Let's get undercover. Don't try too hard to think. Don't think at all. I'm not the only one staring at the sun, afraid of what you'll find if you, look, if you take a look inside. Not just deaf and dumb. I'm staring at the sun. Not the only one who's happy to go blind. The sun is clearly uh, confronting um, and exposing truth of our corrupted condition. Um, so now we're back to um, the cave picture. Um, yes, up until now, virtually everyone has had no choice during their adolescence but to resign to hiding from the sun deep inside Plato's metaphorical dark cave. Um, that's the only way we could cope. So that's where we live, in darkness. That's the real truth. Um, yeah, I might mention that uh, in passing that some people have said about our cover of freedom um, that it looks more like a children's book than a serious authority of scientific presentation. Yeah, well, my response to that is, is that it is a book for children in the sense that it contains a simple, innocent, truthful understanding that enables us to no longer have to fear the sun uh, and be able to live joyfully in its presence. I just love, love our cover. Um, quite a few people have said that over the years. Now, all the pictures in Freedom Essay 30 about resignation... Um, such as these, make it very clear that trying to confront the subject of the human condition without understanding of it has been so unbearable that for almost all adolescents that they had no choice but to resign to living in denial of the subject, a denial that necess necessitates, necessitates blocking out awareness of our all-loving and all-sensitive but unbearably condemning in instinctive self or soul. So these are photos of adolescents, 13 or 40 or whatever, trying to still trying to wrestle with the imperfection of life around them and in themselves and the depression that that gives rise to. And the, the picture in the middle is particularly re revealing. It's, it's a picture of a girl with, um, with a face. She's made a face into the face of a, a snarling wolf. And the text says, uh, it's not a phase, Mum. This is who I really am. So mum just says, look, you'll get over it. You'll get through that. It's just a phase. All this adult bullshit, you know, resigned bullshit. And, and the kid's saying, no, no, this is, what I'm, this is who I really am, mum. I'm, I'm, I'm really a bad person. Um, so at this stage, um, Alex, Alex Akratidis here gave this excellent description of his uh, going through resignation. So... Um, I've got the transcript of what he says, but um, can we play the video maybe of what Alex said? When It's a wonderful description of what resignation he went through. 
Um, my experience of resignation that I happen to remember recently and wrote down. After year nine, when I was 15 years old during the summer holidays, I did absolutely nothing but stay in my room in the darkness, preoccupied with my phone all day, every day, never went out of my room. Curtains down, lights off. I was so nutrient deficient and dehydrated, I would get up off my bed and see stars and feel a fainting sensation. I barely ate food, I barely spoke to my siblings, barely spoke to my parents, would walk past everyone like I was in a different dimension. The alienation was so strong, I just felt like I didn't connect to anyone. Every time I walked out of my room, I felt like I walked into condemnation. Every person personified the reasons why I felt I wasn't good enough as a person. Those summer holidays was when I felt like I had become schizophrenic. I projected an imaginary scenario each day of around four people on each side of my room that I received some sort of validation from. I couldn't bear the agony anymore of the exposure of the imperfections within me and within the world. So the following year, I started year 10 after their summer holidays as if I had hopped into a completely new body. I was numb and felt like a new person as if I had shed my soul from my body. I was completely absorbed by my masks and coping strategies. I was so embedded into denial, there was no longer I could acknowledge any imperfections within me and I fully subscribed to pseudo idealism and my victim mentality to extract reinforcement from my surroundings. So at that point, I just became soul dead of walking zombie. <laughs> wow, well done, Alex. Good one, mate. That's powerful, that'll help a lot of people. But you can see, so he's trying to face down the, the human condition in the world around him and in himself, and it's so unbearably depressing that he's, he's crippled. He, he's totally crippled. And then when she, children at some point have got to give up and, and, and just give up trying to wrestle with the human condition and leave it behind and just get on with life. And, and, and at that point, they become this artificial pseudo, you know, they built all these, become seekers of power, fame, fortune and glory and get, get on with life and, and can't remember any of that. You, a lot of people can't even remember resignation. Alex did well to remember that. I mean, he's pretty young, so he's still within memory of going through it. And um, But again, this gives us a, some idea of why, you know, the, the death effect happens because we're taking us back to this, this interface with this horrific issue of our corrupted condition. This time we're beautifully defended and we can be free of that, but we have this historic fear that as a, as a result of that, that we're being taken back to this dark corner. Anyway, and, th and this practice of denial and its blocking out of our soul is now so deeply entrenched in most people that as R.D. Lang said, there's a veil which is more like 50, 50 feet of solid concrete <clears throat> between us and our true selves or soul. He doesn't say soul, I've added that, our true selves. 50 feet of solid concrete is how much we have blocked out the truth of, uh, about our corrupted condition. So, so that's a good measure of, of how extreme the death effect is, is going to be. So Lawrence Van Post most frequently referred to, quote, in all his books is this line from Jared, uh, Jared Manley Hopkins' poem, No Worse There Is None. Of, o the mind, mind has mountains, cliffs of fall, frightful sheer, no man fathomed. Yes, there were... There was none worse. He said the, the title of the poem is No Worse There Is None. And yeah, there was nothing worse than the frightful suicidal depression that thinking about the human condition could cause while it's still to be fathomed or understood. So thank goodness the human race doesn't have to face any more of this terrible, terrible depression. Um, um, so, yes, the, the problem has been that uh, as the science writer Roger Lewin once said, trying to illuminate the phenomenon of consciousness is a tough challenge, perhaps the toughest of all. Consciousness being the evasive word mechanistic scientists have used for the issue of our corrupted condition, uh, rightly used because um, consciousness is at the heart of the issue of why we became so messed up and what causes us to be worried about being so messed up. Consciousness sort of is the culprit, so it's a good code word to use, yeah. But that's how evasive we are. We, 
the intellectuals, which is all just talk about consciousness, they say consciousness, and everyone, yeah, I know what you're on, but don't go any further than that. And that's what's been going on, all this rubbish. Anyway, yes, someone innocent enough to look into this, and he says, you know, uh, um, yeah, which all explains why my wonderfully honest professor of biology when I was at Sydney University, Charles Birch, wasn't exaggerating the failure trap blindness of human condition avoiding mechanistic science when he said that mechanistic science can't, uh, can't deal with subjectivity. Subjectivity is us, sub we're the subject. Subjectivity. What we were all taught at university is pretty much a dead end. Well, it's not getting into anything, is it? It's just bullshit. And the traditional framework of thinking in science is not adequate for solving the really hard problems. Yeah, it won't go anywhere near but the real issues of the human condition. Biology has not made any real advance since Darwin. And biology right now awaits its Einstein in the realm of consciousness studies. Yeah, someone innocent enough to look into the human, the subject of the human condition and by so doing find the redeeming and healing understanding of it is what, it, what has been desperately needed, which is what I've done. And by the way, this doesn't make me any more special or worthy or deserving than anyone else because uh, exceptional innocence is just one of the inevitable states in the spectrum of alienation that the human race's heroic search for knowledge unavoidably led to. A fundamental insight that, un a fundamental insight that understanding the human condition gives us is the equal goodness and worthiness of all humans. We humans have been involved in a great and necessary battle. So we, we have inevit inevitably all been variously knocked around in that great battle. But we are all heroes, every people, even people like me who were lucky enough to not have been involved in the thick of the battle during, during their infancy and childhood are heroes. Everyone is actually a bigger hero than me, and it's true, but I can still claim to be a hero, so there you go. <laughs> um, uh, so what I've just said is the truth. I am less of a hero than anyone in this room, which is why last night, Lucas, I didn't... Uh, want you thinking, thanking me for any damn thing. Because Lucas said, yeah, I want to just thank you, Jeremy. So I said, he said, how can <laughs> I ever thank you? How can we ever thank you? Oh, shit. <laughs> Don't we go around this loop. I've just been through it. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's, um, it's true. It's amazing what I've done. But you got to understand, I, I didn't set out to be a legend or any fucking thing. I just did what everyone's trying to do, make sense of my life. And since I was coming from a very innocent situation, that's the way I, I got here. I mean, people, you know, think they, um, like those quotes from Sam and, and Tony, you know, they couldn't make sense of anything. It was just, there was no meaning. There was no structure. Everything was just a mess. And, and, and everyone knows that and everyone tries to, to sort that out and, and can't get anywhere can't get to the bottom of it at all. It just can't even begin to know where to start tackling it. So it, it's an absolute astonishment that, that somebody did un, unscramble it. But the way they did it, um, the way I did it was I just did what they're doing. They're, they're trying to think and make sense of it. But I'm coming from an incredibly innocent position, so I'm thinking truthfully. And see, I was struggling because you know, I'll talk about it a bit later. The world was so damn mad, you know, and I had, couldn't understand it at all. And, and um, it's a huge problem for me. And um, then I found uh, Vanderpost's book. My mother gave me this book, um, Vanderpost, I think, Venture to the Interior, because I remember the photo, the picture of the um, zebras running across the cover. And see, Vanderpost is an honest thinker. He, he talks about the original innocence of the Bushmen. And he was saying things, paragraph and paragraph, and I was like, this guy's telling me I'm not mad after all. So that saved my life. So you, I was untouchable, untouchable then. No one was ever going to shake me and I never have. Because they're bullshitting and I'm not. And, and, and I'm hanging on to what I know is true and, and nothing else matters and I have no interest in that other world. And, and, and that's how I got there. I just kept thinking truthfully from that basis. 
And so it is miraculous when you stand back at this point, but I'm just a human trying to make sense of life like everybody else, and I, but just coming from a very innocent position. So I didn't set out to be a legend or any damn thing, and I'm not. As I fully explain, you know, I'm, every, I'm just one of the spectrum of alienation as a result of this heroic battle. You know, if there's a great battle and you've got some people in the middle of it cut to shreds, you know, dying of depression from extreme alienation... They're, they're the most heroic to endure that. Someone that missed out is out. I was sitting under a tree scratching my ear when everyone else was getting their heads chopped off, you know. Then I come out and say, I'll find the human condition, you know. But they're the legends, honestly, you know. It's just, I'm not. This stuff, you know, sorts it all out. It makes sense. Of, it does. It gets rid of all that shit, all that elitism and. Demystifies the whole thing. Like, huh? It demystifies the whole thing. Yeah. And like Franklin Mukukanga said, it's just the power of a soul still alive while you've been able to solve the human condition. Yeah, I know. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> Don't worry. I, you know, I walk around and say, oh, that's not bad evidence. <laughs> but I think I might get on this ego bandwagon. <laughs> I'm always, jo- always making jokes with Tony about it. You know, come on, say that again. <laughs> I was playing that game with you, Lucas, yesterday. I, mean, uh, I, I was saying, we're talking about Alex's ability to, to sing, you know, and I said to Lucas, so where's your fucking song, mate? <laughs> but I'm trying to, you know, it's, if you watch what I'm doing with people all the time, I'm trying to take the load off their shoulders, trying to make... Make make them make their load lighter and 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 help them. And Lucas is a really sensitive soul, and um, so I'm so pleased you're out here, mate. Because this this fucking joint will look after you like nothing. Um, sorry, I better get back on the job. Uh, okay, so the human condition has been solved, but there is still one massive impasse to overcome, which is that. The historic fear we, we humans carry of the issue of the human condition blocks the ability to hear and read about the human condition and dis- discover that it's finally been made safe to confront and from there discover the most wonderful of all gifts of being able to understand themselves and the world and completely move on from the human condition. Uh, the deaf effect problem is very real. Now, this is a, a Swiss bloke who... who um, he... he t- He'd been teaching our book for years, our stuff, and he's got, he puts them on mushrooms or some drug or something and, and tries to break up their historic denial so they can start to hear this stuff. He's got all these meditative techniques to sort of get people to, that's his way of solving the deaf effect. He, he knows it, you know, that's what he struggled with. He says, um, the root problem is the guilt, which is buried so deep, it's hard to get, get there. How much courage that needs. When the question pops up of if they're good or evil, the possibility that they are actually evil, they shy away, they try everything to avoid going to that point, which is what Ari said, you know, you know, as soon as I started reading, you know, that I'm a, you know, power, fame, fortune, glory or whatever, or I'm egocentric or selfish and because their whole existence, Ari, like every bloke's built this massive defensive castle and he's got a few wins, he's been made um, head of the fire brigade or whatever fuck, you know, whatever other win you got and you swan around and, and uh, keep it all at bay, you know. And so, yeah, every day, as Tony Gowing's always telling, teaching us, is every moment is trying to maximise the positive and minimise the negatives and, and posturing and carrying on and everything we do. And here I've got this show and I've got all this on and I've got a nice puffy blue shirt and carry on. And it's all this masquerading and, and it's all because we're so deeply insecure. And so, as Ari said, you know, you know, as soon as I started reading that I'm supposed to, you know, that I'm competitive, aggressive and selfish, I, I said, that's, that's not me, I don't relate to that. I mean, the book goes on to explain we're two million years stuffed, let alone just a little bit. But um, uh, it's true, you know, uh, they, they switch off. And, and so this guy, this Swiss guy, He's, I haven't been in touch with him for a long time, but I don't know how he's going, but that's what he does to get us to, to overcome it. He gives it, the stuff out of books to people and he gets them to meditate and God knows whatever else, stand on their head, I don't know what they do, but 
gets them on certain mushrooms, I don't know. But then that sort of breaks up the historic block, which is incredibly strong. And then they can hear this. <coughs> so yes, <coughs> the, one fin <coughs> the one final problem for the human race now is overcoming the deaf effect in enough people for a critical mass of appreciative people to appear for everyone else to realise that it is actually safe now to confront the human condition. At this point, I want to mention that there is a small category of people who don't particularly suffer from the deaf effect. They are what we refer to in the WTM as ships at sea. People who, for various reasons, in some rare cases because they're relatively innocent so haven't had to resign, bravely refuse to pull into a port, as it were, and resign to living in denial uh, when the storms of unbearable self-confrontation occur during their adolescence. Now, um, Lucas here is, is in, in our estimation, a kind of ship at sea, and and um, and um, so I, I might play this description of how he couldn't understand the world and refused to buy into it. Uh, is that okay by you, Lucas? It's yeah. in your... <laughs> That's why I made the video. So. <laughs> so this is this is Lucas' ship at sea story. Yeah, before I encountered the information, I was actually really stuck in myself, and I wasn't even trying to look at the world anymore. I wasn't watching the news, and I was pretty concerned just about my own human condition and trying to hide it from people, trying not to show that I was depressive, not looking at people, go taking distance from my family, traveling to another country and always being on the run, always um, having changing groups of friends and changing works. And I was just trying to wrestle and understand what was going on in my head and that's when I found the information and it was really on time because I was really starting to wonder whether I was just going mad. I was starting to ask people. Thankfully, it seems not and now I feel, I feel here, I feel... I understand myself, I understand my, my life, I understand other people's life. I can understand my family, the people I grew up with, or even people I just met. I can, I can tell what they are trying to do, their strategies, how they cope with life. So yeah, it's pretty exciting. It's a wonderful tool, but it's more than a tool. It's not just a way to understand and screw on people, it's a way to really understand people to the core and be able to love and appreciate them for who they are and for what they're doing. Good one, Lucas. Well done, mate. Good effort. Um, that's pretty special. Um, yeah, you, if you, I've only spent half an hour with Lucas, um, but he's a sensitive dude. Most people, once they resign, has... Um, Alex was saying, get on with life and, you know, it's all about escapism and power and glory and distraction and next party and get pissed and whatever, you know, it's just rip and roar. And this other state where you're back there stranded trying to make sense of the world is a totally different existence. So people in, in the midst of resignation, totally different to once you get past resignation, which Alex described so well. And, and um, so to hold on... Uh, who's um, Olaf from uh, Sweden? Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> Olaf came out and visited us too, and he's got started to Sweden. And he's a similar. He's a ship at sea, and he's very, very distressed and still traumatized by the world. He hadn't given up on looking at it, and still. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, people who um, are ships at sea and they discover this, they just cannot. And can I believe the relief they get? They just, there's just no deaf effect. Where is, we had a 16 year old said, I read one of them books all in one night. And it's just such a relief. And, and so there's this world of difference between the pre resigned state and the post resigned state. So once you get in the post resigned state, once you resign, then obviously this whole issue of our corrupted state is something you blocked out. You went, went to fearful state of depression. Like um, Lucas described, how how he was running away from everything and couldn't cope, and and Alex was just locked in his room and and so on, and 
And then to be able to make sense of all that is, is, is the most incredible relief. Um, um, <clears throat> so it's, it's also these ships at sea who haven't resigned to living in denial of the human condition who can most help get uh, support of this world-saving understanding going. They and, and anyone else who has been able to either avoid or get through the death effect have to lead the world home to freedom from the human condition. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you, you'll notice if, if you read the ecstatic responses on the slider on our homepage, how quite a few of these people uh, who, who don't suffer from the death effect and, uh, and can immediately take in or hear and become excited about the explanation of the human condition uh, are ships at sea. For example, these are two from the last few days. I always wondered why I thought and acted differently. This is my confirmation, beautifully explained. I'm now truly free. And there's another one. Just what I wanted to hear to understand why I'm not abnormal. And, and, and I think um, Stefan said he was, he was a, uh, he thought he alien. was a, an alien. <laughs> There's a few people have said that. They get so distressed. They, they, their thinking is so different that they finally decide, well, look, I must be from an alien from another planet. I'm no, <laughs> no relation to all these people. Like Alex wouldn't pre-resigned self wouldn't have been able to relate, relate to his resigned self. That was just on a bender of distraction, escapism and delusion, joining the, the environment or climate change or woke movements to make himself feel good. The, the, the pseudo-idealistic coping strategies that Alex said he had to fully subscribe to to escape feeling condemnation. And so his pre-resigned self and resigned self are totally different people. Um, An incredible example of a pre-resigned, honest mind. Uh, so, yes. Yes, I, I, got, I missed a bit there. So, up until now, only young adolescents who are yet to become resigned and rare, exceptionally honest thinkers like Van der Post, Sir Lawrence Van der Post and Artie Lang, and rare, exceptionally brave artists like Bacon and Goya and Munch could look at the human condition with any degree of honesty. The following examples of such people serve to illustrate just how alienated the human race has become and therefore how precious the most wonderful of gifts of being able to understand ourselves is. So this is a, an incredible um, example from a pre-resigned honest mind. Uh, it's the lyrics from the American heavy metal band with Life in Mind's album, Grievances, um, that one of them the, the lyrics that one of them wrote when they were still a young teenager. And look at the cover. I mean, you know, the world is mad. You know, there's this person screaming, being beaten up uh, with life in mind. I mean, that's um, human condition in mind. So these are the words. They're just unbelievably free of any, any resignation. This is, this is a true description of our world. Do you want it? This is it. It scares me to death to think of what I have become. I feel so lost in this world. Our innocence is lost. I scream to the sky, but my words get lost along the way. I can't express all the hate that's led me here and all the filth that swallows us whole. I don't want to be part of all this insanity, famine and death, pestilence and war, a world shrouded in darkness. Fear is driven into, into our minds everywhere we look, trying so hard for a life with, with such little purpose, lost in oblivion. Everything you've been told has been a lie. We've all been asleep since the beginning of time. Why are we so scared to use our minds? Keep pretending soon enough things will crumble to the ground. If they could only see the truth, they would coil in disgust. How do we save ourselves from this misery? So desperate for the answers. We're straining on the last bits of hope we have left. No one hears our cries. And no one sees us screaming. This is the end. Wow, that's pretty good, isn't it? What do you think of that, Alex? That's not bad. Um, so this next picture is Munch's uh, scream, you know, because this guy said, you know, we scream to the heavens and no one hears us. And this is a really powerful picture. Everyone, it's a very famous picture, this thing. Everyone's got it. All the kids have got it pinned up in their rooms and stuff like this, but no one's ever really explained it. Not like we can now. An incredible example of the honesty of some artists uh, were capable of is Munch is the famous painting The Scream. He dared to depict the scream with uh, that with life in mind said no one hears or sees. 
Um, yeah, I mean, this is a. He, so you got to see these two people here. They're walking down this uh, this um, pier in a, on the edge of the sea. But it's really powerful because these two people are like normal humans, normal being totally resigned, to pretending everything's fine and as it should be, so they're swanning along, along the edge of the pier, saying, oh, it's a lovely sunset, so we go down and have an ice cream, whatever the fuck. And this person's screaming their head off and the whole environment's just resonating with the horror of it. So these two people contrasted to that is a really, really powerful presentation. Um, but, you know... Um, for daring to, to uh, the bravery of Munch for daring to confront the human condition was made clear when he said that at one period in his life, my condition was verging on madness. It was touch and go. So to be an artist and try to cut your way to, through to the truth, a window into the truth, like, like, like Van Gogh, you know, he, he painted, he, he taught us to see light. We couldn't see light until it's true. Till he painted it, and he, because he, he was just so honest, and he made himself so honest. He just kept making himself more and more honest. So he painted these these amazing pictures, and and when you look at them, you can see light for the first time, the brightness of it, and everything was, you know, the sunflower. He could paint anything, like a sunflower in a, in a vase or something. And suddenly it was, it, it came alive, and um, but he cut off his ear and went mad and did everything. Poor bugger, you know, to, to be an artist to try to dig into the truth, whatever form of art you were pursuing is, is a torturous existence. It no longer is because we can now understand the whole damn thing. Now, this is a really good one. you like this one. In the case of Francis, Francisco, is that, are we talking Spanish or Portuguese? Francisco. Or what, like? what? Francisco. Francisco. <laughs> Don't look at me like that, Lucas. I'm working on it, mate. I'll be, I'll be multilingual before you know it. Um, uh, we saw the courageous honesty of, of his etching earlier, the sleep of reason bringing forth minds. But, but he also did two contrasting paintings that are incredibly revealing of the human condition, which I include in Freedom Essay 44. Uh, as the art critic Robert Hughes described them, there are two paintings of the same subject. They are of a big religious festival that is San Isidoro. Um, on that day, thousands of citizens in their Sunday best converge on a pilgrimage chapel outside Madrid and have, and have a picnic. See, they all are. In the first representation titled Isidoro Meadow, Hugh said the girls are in their white parasols and the men in their finery. The scene is of a social of social pleasure and jollity, which it surely is. Now then, put this picture up. Then, according to Hughes, 30 years later, Goya returned to the same theme. In this picture, titled The Pilgrimage of Santa Isadora, instead of these happy, fashionable, well-dressed young people, you have this horrible snake of dark figures like demons crawling across an ash heap. Their faces are of madmen and hysterics. The whole picture is deeply threatening. So that's the same picture to, to that. Um, so Goya clearly knew humanity was living a completely fraudulent, escapist, deluded existence. Accompanying one of his etchings, he even wrote that the world is a masquerade. Looks, dress and voice, everything is only pretension. Everyone wants to appear to be what, what he is not. Everyone is deceiving. And no one even knows himself. So Goya was a brave dude, hey? And, uh, and this stands next to, with Life in Mind's lyrics from that, that heavy metal man, kid, you know. This is Artie Lang. The case of exceptionally honest thinkers, the great Scottish psychiatrist Artie Lang, description of the human condition is without peer. Our alienation goes to the roots. The realisation of this is the essential springboard for, the, for any serious reflection on any aspect of present interhuman life. We are born into a world where alienation awaits us. We are potentially men but are in an alienated state. The ordinary person is a shriveled, desiccated fragment of what a person can be. As adults, we, ha we have forgotten most of our childhood, not only its contents but its flavour. As men of the world, we hardly know of the existence of the inner world, the condition of alienation of being asleep, 
of being unconscious, of being out of one's mind is the condition of the normal man. Between us and it, our truth or self or soul in other words, there is a veil which is more like 50 feet of solid concrete, des abscondus, that's a more funny language, um, or we have absconded. I mean, that could be Irish for all I know. Nick, I don't know it might be French or I don't know. It's one of them things. Uh, the outer divorce from any illumination from the inner is a state of darkness. We are in an age of darkness. The state of outer darkness is a state of sin, i.e. alienation or estrangement from the inner light. We are all murderers and prostitutes. We are bemused and crazed creatures, strangers to our true selves, to one another. We are dead but think we are alive. We are asleep but think we are awake. We are dreaming but we take our dreams to be reality. We are the halt, lame, blind, deaf and sick. We are doubly unconscious. We are so ill that we no longer feel ill, as in many terminal illnesses. We are mad but have no insight into the fact of our madness. We are so out of touch with this realm, with the issue of the human condition lies, that many people can now argue seriously it doesn't even exist. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I was watching someone going along picking up litter from a footpath and he was so enthusiastic and seemingly feeling fulfilled and meaningful by doing that. Uh, doing it, that, that I felt sure he was believing that everything in the world is relatively ordered and in good shape, and he just needed to clean it up a bit to make it all perfect. Uh, it was like he had no idea there were there's two million years of psychotic alienation from our true selves or soul in us humans. In fact, that they were, we're fast approaching terminal alienation, the extinction of our species. Um, um, <clears throat> yes, as Artie Lang said, we are the halt, lame, blind, deaf and sick, but we are doubly unconscious. We are so ill, we have no longer, we no longer feel ill, as in many terminal illnesses. We are mad, but have no insight into the fact of our madness. Again, we see how extremely unaware resigned humans have been to the horrifically corrupted state of the human condition, and therefore, how hearing or reading about the human condition initially causes uh, the complete deaf effect. Yeah, when I was growing up being so innocent, I was completely and utterly bewildered by the world of adults because they were carrying on as if everything was fine and I could see it wasn't. So it was all an incredible agony for me, so much so I almost had to find these understandings of the human condition I found to save my life. Many times I would run away through the night from gatherings because I thought everyone was so fake and artificial and dishonest. On one occasion in my 20s, I stood on a chair and in a loud voice told all the celebrities in this vast room that they were all frauds. Uh, it didn't go down well. Anyway, that's all history now as it is for the whole human race because the whole human race is coming home at last to soundness and sanity. So that brings me to the end of this talk. That explains why, to quote Benjamin Disraeli, our species, our species has been stranded halfway between ape and angel and how we can now all become angels again people living happy and free of the human condition. Um, I found that so astonishing, that that talk. It was just extraordinary because, uh, the, I mean, that to, 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 for, for the soul alive to speak to the soul dead, like the resigned state is necessarily and so heroically, like you've said, it is a, a state of darkness and untouchability because you're so defensive against anything that takes you near the human condition. And if anything does, you just get absolutely furious. And, and it's going to take the power of that soul, that, that incredible empathy and sensitivity and compassion to reach over there and tell us that we were once that sensitive and happy and joyful and full of love that the mysteries of the physical world didn't even bother us. I mean, that was just just hit me in the in the chest like mm. and you say this is like a weapon against the deaf effect and I just pray that that will reach them because like you say you, you've got to buy some time for their brain to be tolerant enough to actually hear the defense of that blackness mm. and that's what was so astonishing about that talk you took us all back right to the beginning where we all started and when we were all sensitive and beautiful and loving and I just feel that that really could reach, you know, like Van der Post said, the men that have become, their hearts have become stone and they had to become stone, my heart's stone. And when I listen to you, I, that softens. <laughs> 
and it lets it in and I feel loved and defended and so inspired. So I, I just think that was the most astonishing talk, Jeremy. Thank you. <laughs>